want to welcome you to our services for Carmichael Baptist Church. So good to be with you again and get into the Word of God and get into our study of the Psalms. I can't get enough of those. And of course, we have a long ways to go if we're going to go to 150. Uh, I just do five at a time before moving on to another series, but I never want to get away from it. We're in Psalm 37 today, and this is a longer psalm. So I'm breaking it down into a couple messages. There are actually a couple themes that stood out to me in this psalm. The theme I'm going to focus on really in just just the first 11 verses in this message is a childlike peace. You know, it's fascinating how we long throughout our youth to get older, to grow up, to be on our own. But then, as adults, sometimes we look at our children with envy. They're not concerned about putting food on the table or a roof over their heads. They don't stress about situations at work. Mom and Dad are there for them. We find out quickly, growing up is not so easy. We've got to take responsibility. We've got to face the hard realities of life, being an adult. But then this psalm shows how that the believer can keep that same peace. Now, we've still got to be grown-ups in this world, obviously. We've got responsibilities. We've got our challenges. But when I talk about peace, I mean just that knowledge that someone greater than us, really greater than all things, is in control. And of course, that's the Lord. Perhaps the theme verses that I'm going to bring out in both of these messages of this psalm is verses 23 through 25. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young, and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread." kind of brings to my mind a toddler first learning how to walk, and their feet are unsteady, and they they rock uh, back and forth, and maybe start to fall over, but their their parents are holding their arms. They're kind of sturdying them, and maybe they pick them up and even carry them for a time because they can't walk well. Well, David, as an older man, he's kind of looking back at his whole life with that perspective. He struggled. And he fell into so many sins. He faced overwhelming hardships. He had the the weight of a whole kingdom resting upon his shoulders. But his heavenly father never let him go. He led the way. He's always providing for him in a perfect fashion. And now David's an older man and he's facing the grave, but he doesn't lose that peace. He doesn't lose lose that assurance. And he writes this beautiful psalm just to encourage us in this in this childlike peace that ought to encompass every part of a believer's life. Let's break this down. We start in verse 1. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious because of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Trust in the Lord. That's the first part of peace, is trust. You know, in this life, we're going to see a prospering wicked. You look at entertainment and you see how Christianity is mocked and how sin is embraced. You certainly can see corrupt the leaders, sometimes corrupt businesses, use their power to take advantage of the weak. It's a dog-eat-dog world. The bad guy wins all the time out there. You watch the news, it's enough to make you fret to be filled with fear or depression, especially as you're looking at it from the standpoint of your own control and realize you're not in control. It's chaos out there. You know, even worse, this can make you envious. I think about Asaph when he pens Psalm 73. He's frustrated in his Christian life and he's looking out at the world and he says in verse 12, Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. What is this sacrifice bringing me? This sacrifice for Christ? What's it really doing? Where is the reward? Where's the benefit? Where's the victory? It seems like it's all in vain. 
I would guess if you've been a Christian for any period of time, you've struggled with some of those thoughts. You've tempted, you've been tempted to envy the wicked. But you know, before the Lord, we're like a little child. Our perspective of what is going on, both in this world and in our life, is so small compared to his perfect knowledge. Can you not think back to times in your life where something made so much sense to you, this is what I should be doing, and your parents just said, nope. And you, you wanted an explanation. Why? Why can't I do this? Why can't we do this? Because I said so. Man, I hated that as a kid, but I got that response all the time. And you know, looking back, I could kind of see the point. I, I say it to my children sometimes. I don't have time to explain everything to you. It's not for you to know. You need to trust me. Looking back, I'm thankful I didn't eat cookies every night for dinner. I didn't ride my bike out in the middle of the busy street. My parents knew better than I did what I needed. And of course, they're imperfect. But God is perfect. We can trust Him as our Heavenly Father. He knows exactly how much money that you need. He knows what abilities and strengths that you ought to have for what He's put before you. He even knows you the right health condition and how long you need to be on this earth. And we've got to trust His perfect wisdom and love. He's not going to give you everything you want. Somebody that comes and begins to preach some kind of gospel that says God's going to give you uh, every worldly desire that you could want if you just believe it. Well, that's a person that's not preaching the true gospel. God loves us too much to do that. He knows that we desire things in this world that would pull us from Him, would corrupt our hearts or lead us into harmful situations. He cares for us too much to give us those worldly desires. But you know, you look by comparison to the, the empty and temporal pleasures of the wicked. And sometimes it seems God lets them get exactly what they want. That's not a blessing. They're described in this psalm like the grass shoots up and withers away. Here in California, that's kind of what's going on now. We're having a rainy season with the green grass is shooting up everywhere this time of year as we're here in March. But I can tell you by the end of May, the, the rain has stopped, the 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 dry season comes on, and it, man, it all turns brown, just withers away. That season is so quick. And that's the wicked. Don't envy them. Don't grumble against God because you, what, what, of what you lack here. He has far greater blessings for you. If you're going to have peace, you've got to trust the Lord. You can't base things on what you see or what you feel or how you reason. Trust the Lord. But then another aspect of this peace is to delight in the Lord. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. You know, a good parent loves not just to sustain their children. He, they want to make their children happy. One of my greatest joys is to see delight on the faces of my kids. And I assure you, that's the spirit of our loving Heavenly Father towards us. And I, and I know that's kind of hard to believe when you're going through the midst of a hardship. We're tempted to think, man, God's angry with me. God's forgotten me. God's disinterested with me. Something's wrong. Here's the promise. I, I'll just show you the verse. God rejoices to give you the desires of your heart. That is a promise. Now, don't think that I'm going against what I just said a minute ago. When I talk about God giving you the desires of your heart in this promise, that's not about worldly desires. You can't separate that promise from the first part of the verse that says, Delight thyself in the Lord. True joy doesn't come from wealth or power or possessions in this world. And as long as those are your delight, as I already told you, if you're a believer, God's going to withhold perhaps some of those things as a mercy. You're going to be unfulfilled. You're never going to find fulfillment out there. The mature believer learns to pray like Asaph did at the end of Psalm 73. He started out envying the wicked, but he came to the point as he sought the Lord. In verse 25, he realized what, he, what really brought delight. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Here's the delight. Lord, I want you. Not what you could give me, 
how easy you can make my life, how good you can make me feel. No, you. I want a closer relationship with you to experience your presence, to understand your greatness and your goodness and your love more clearly, to know that I'm pleasing you in this life. You know, if that's your delight, you can just take the promise of Psalm 37 to 4 to heart. He's going to abundantly fulfill that desire. You know, you think about your little child or maybe a grandchild and they come up to you and they got open arms and they just want to spend time with you. What's more precious than that? When you delight in the Lord, here's the thing. He's delighting infinitely more in you. He's never going to withhold his fellowship. You're going to find yourself growing closer and closer to him, rejoicing more and more in his promises and in his work in your life. But you need to get your delight right. If you're going to find the peace and fulfillment that's promised in verse 4, you've got to delight in the Lord. And then number three, follow the Lord. Verse 5, commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noonday. You know, I remember as a child how easy it was to take a road trip. I enjoyed those. I didn't have to consult maps. I didn't have to worry about traffic. I didn't have to try to figure out where we're going to stop, where we're going to eat. I just curled up in the back seat and went to sleep. I didn't even have to wear a seatbelt back then. Dad was at the wheel. He's taken me where I need to go. Well, this is the perspective of life that we're given as believers. Yes, again, we still have to make decisions. We have to accept responsibility. But the way is laid out for us. It's laid out right here in, the, in God's Word. Here is perfect wisdom for every situation. But the thing is, it's not just words on a page for us to learn in our minds. God's given the Holy Spirit that takes this truth and makes it real to us. And it impresses it upon us, chastens us with it, convicts us, guides us, encourages us. He takes us where we need to go. I'm thankful to know God is the one that's leading. God is going to fulfill His purpose and bring me out blessed in the end as I follow Him. That is an assurance, a, a verse I often use because it's, well, perhaps a verse that struck me more than any in the scriptures as a guide for my life is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. What a comfort to know. My sovereign, loving, faithful God is at the wheel of my life. And when that's the case, I can have peace. I might not understand why I'm taking the path I'm taking and the hardships and the trials, and, and those aren't easy, but I know he's leading. And so I can have that childlike assurance he's going to take me where I need to go. Follow the Lord. But then verse 7, wait on the Lord. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in the way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. This kind of brings up a childhood struggle for me. One of the reasons we don't like being kids, because you got to wait for things. And time, boy, it moved so much slower back then, especially leading up to uh, something I was looking forward to, a trip or, or my birthday or Christmas. Part of being a kid, is resting in the leadership of someone greater. And you got to wait for them to act and to provide on their timetable because they're in control and you're not. And that's hard. In a real sense, this is how it is for, as a believer. This is what we recognize by faith. We live by God's timetable and not ours. We're told of the Old Testament saints in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, they died in faith not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Faith means waiting. Waiting is kind of a key element of faith, isn't it? If you don't have to wait, it doesn't require much faith. These heroes of the faith, sometimes we call them in Hebrews 11, they had to wait. They didn't see the fulfillment. Here's Abraham, it takes his whole life. 
followed the Lord out of Ur, the Chaldees, goes into the land of Canaan, continually lives in a tent. God says, it's all yours, but other people had the cities, not Abraham. He suffered. He waited patiently. In the end, the only thing that he owned, the only piece of property he owned, there was a grave. But the promises of the Lord were not in vain. There was a promised land he would know eternally. There is a Savior that would come in whom all nations would be blessed from his seed that would fulfill all the hope of salvation. Waiting on the Lord is never in vain. Sometimes you can wait for something your parents say and things don't work out. They're not in control. But waiting on the Lord, you can be assured he's going to fulfill every promise. And he's not just going to fulfill it. He's going to do it at the exact right time. It's not that he's too busy. He's got an appointed time to fulfill his promise. So right now, here you are. You might be in the midst of a crisis and loss. Time slows down as you're suffering, as you're sorrowing. And the wicked seem to prosper. But you need to, to kind of step back and see a bigger picture. Even though we don't know how everything that's going to happen, we understand that the events of this world, it's like a tiny blip on God's timeline. And this psalm brings that out. It tries to, or it doesn't try, it gives us that perspective as we lay hold of it. In fact, we look on at verse 8. It says, Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Don't act rashly. Feel like you've got to solve your problem. God's in control. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. Now, I do want to bring something out. Waiting on the Lord is an active thing. It doesn't mean that we sit around just hoping something good happens one day and we just grit our teeth and try to endure life and get through it, hoping one day we'll be happy in eternity. Waiting means this. It means to rise up from your doubts and your fears and your complaints and just follow the Lord where He would lead you. Trust the Lord, delight in the Lord, and follow the Lord. And the waiting component means you keep doing it. It means that that's not a day of conversion. It means that that's not a momentary thing. It means that day in and day out, you're living for Him. You're keeping His promises before you. You're making His delight above all the desires in this world. And even if years and decades pass, if things seem to get worse, if you see no physical reward for all those things, you don't quit. That's waiting on the Lord. And that's hard. Patience is very hard, but we're assured it's wonderfully rewarded. Verse 11 is where this all leads to. Notice this. It says, The meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Does that sound familiar to you? Well, it's a verse Jesus himself quoted during a sermon on the mount. Matthew 5, 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Somebody that is meek encompasses all that we've talked about this morning. It's somebody that is humbled in their spirit. They've got that childlike faith in the Lord, and so they're not trying to take control and dominate, and push things the way they want to go. They're following the Lord. They're humble in their spirit and in their action. Instead of striving for selfish gain, they're showing love to God and man, trusting the Lord to lift them up. And I, I love what Jesus says. The meek don't conquer the earth. The meek inherit the earth. Think about that. We're the children of God. He's the one that the earth belongs to, and we inherit it. Now, meekness might seem like weakness. A lot of people want to equate those two. We, you talk about the faith of a child, and that's not impressive. It's, this should be impressive. Somebody that is meek is not scared. He's not afraid to stand up and do what's right. Quite the opposite. He has the Almighty on his side. There's a good quote from James Montgomery Boyce. He says, Meekness will always take off its shoes before the burning bush, but in the power of God it will always be able to stand tall before the powerful of this world. Of course, making you think of Moses, who's described by the Lord 
as meek above all that were on the earth. Meekness says, God is going to lead and I'm going to follow. But as he's doing that, I'm going to boldly follow and do what's right. And that's a person that finds real peace in life, real confidence and true joy. As we mature in the Lord, we need to seek to know more of that. Instead of striving for worldly greatness and envy in the wicked, I want to know more of this meekness, this childlike peace. Trust in the Lord, delight in the Lord, follow the Lord, wait on the Lord. And you're going to find the desires of your heart fulfilled. You're going to find a purposeful life. You're going to find assurance that He's accomplishing good. Even if the physical things aren't impressive to those around you, you're going to be spiritually blessed above all all the world around you. What a, what a wonderful promise. What a wonderful psalm that we've looked at. And we really just started. We're going to get more in depth into the later part of the psalm, and particularly verses 23 through 25. I want to spend more time breaking those down in the next message. But I just want you to consider your life and examine it according to Psalm 37. And boy, make this a guide to your life. What more could we seek than this childlike peace that comes from our Heavenly Father. May the Lord bless you.